Welcome to this information session called Looking After Your Health. It provides information on looking after your health, how the health system works in the UK, and how you can get help if you need it. This session is part of the North East Migration Partnerships Refugee and Asylum Seeker Orientation Project. What is the National Health Service? This is often shortened to be called the NHS. You're entitled to access health services provided by the NHS if you have made an application for asylum and are receiving support from the Home Office. You can access the following services for free. General Practitioners, also known as GPs. You might know them as doctors. You can also access hospitals and you can access maternity services, which are services for women who are having a baby. The NHS provides services to those who need medical treatment and can also help with areas such as contraception, family planning, healthy eating and mental health. Your health will not affect your immigration status or affect what NHS services are available to you. None of the people who work for the NHS, including doctors, nurses and interpreters, will pass on any information about your health to any other person or organisation outside the NHS without your permission, except in very exceptional circumstances, such as if the doctor believes you may be of harm to yourself or others. Slide 3. What are GP services? GPs are highly skilled doctors who are trained in all aspects of general medicine, including child health, adult medicine and mental health. They work in the community and also provide services such as antenatal care, which is care for pregnant women and their unborn children, vaccinations, and advice on smoking and diet. You need to register with a GP as soon as you can when you arrive, so you can access the service when you need to. They can give you reminders about health checks and provide support to keep you healthy or if you are unwell. Visit a GP if it is not an emergency and you need to see a doctor or nurse about your health. It is important to self-manage where possible if you have a minor illness or go to a pharmacy for advice before seeing a GP. The role of the pharmacy will be explained shortly. Slide four. GPs act as gatekeepers for specialist services. This means that they can refer or send you to specialist services that you may need. This can include other doctors or health professionals who specialise in different health issues, such as dietitians, physiotherapists, or for an X-ray. They can also refer your children to any specialist service they may need, such as health visitors, who look after the health of children under the age of five, or paediatricians. You can only access these specialists through your GP. You cannot approach them directly. Slide five. How do I register with a GP? Go to a local GP practice and ask for a registration form. Ask for help if you need it to fill in the form, as interpreters can be booked if necessary. You have the right to an interpreter. You will need to give your name, address and telephone number if you have one. You may be asked for proof of identity and proof of address, but you cannot be refused registration if you do not have these available you can take your Mears Occupancy Agreement as proof of address. 
A GP surgery can refuse your application if they have reasonable grounds for doing so, such as if they do not have capacity for new patients, but they must notify you of this decision and reasons behind it in writing within 14 days of the decision. If this happens, you can either ask your housing manager for advice about identifying an alternative GP to register with, or use the Find a GP search tool on the NHS website. After registering with a GP, you might be asked to have a health check. It is important to attend this appointment even if you are well. If you move to a different part of the UK, you will need to register with a new GP. Slide 6. These phrases could be useful at a GP practice. Please can I register at this GP practice? Please can I register at this GP practice? I need help to fill in this form. I need help to fill in this form. I don't understand this. I need an interpreter. I don't understand this. I need an interpreter. Slide 7. This is the form which needs to be completed. It is available at the GP practice or online. Slide 8. HC2 certificates. Your HC2 certificate is proof that you are entitled to free health care, including dental costs, eye care, travel costs, prescription costs, and wig and fabric supports. You should be given one when you leave initial accommodation. It looks like this. Take it with you to the GP, dentist and optician. The HC2 certificate is also proof that you are entitled to free travel costs for some hospital appointments. To gain a refund on travel costs, you will need to show your bus or train ticket and proof of your appointment. If you have been charged for treatment, it could be a mistake and you can ask for help in checking. Your HC2 form will be valid for six months, then you need to renew it. Slide 9. If you do not have an HC2 form or you need to renew it, then you need to complete an HC1 form. It looks like this. You can order or download these online or they may be available in the local GP practice or hospital. It is very important to complete this, so ask for help if you need it. You will then be sent an HC2 form. Your HC2 form will be valid for six months. Then you need to renew it. These are the first two pages. Slide 10. And these are the second two pages. Remember to ask for help if you need it to complete these forms correctly. Slide 11. Where to go for medical help. It is important to seek the right medical help if you need it. For minor issues such as a sore throat or a grazed knee, self-care is most appropriate. NHS 111 is free to phone for advice on medical problems and if you are not sure what to do. Phone 111 on your phone. It is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and you can ask for an interpreter if you need one. Depending on the situation, you'll find out what local service can help you, 
or be connected to a nurse, emergency dentist, pharmacist or GP or get a face-to-face -face appointment if you need one or be told how to get any medication you need or get self-care advice. The pharmacist can give advice and help with is issues such as diarrhea, runny nose and headache. They can advise you on the best medication to take if that is required. However, you may have to pay for some of this. The role of the pharmacy will be explained in more detail shortly. As explained, visit a GP if it is not an emergency and you need to see a doctor or nurse about your health. You should, however, seek to manage by self-care and advice from the pharmacy first. Only go to the GP if you need to. Go to Accident and Emergency, referred to as A and E, or phone 999 in an emergency situation, such as choking, severe bleeding, chest pain, or blacking out. Slide 12 emergency services. If you have a serious accident or sudden serious illness, you should go to your nearest hospital with an A and E department, an accident and emergency department. Do not use A and E for minor medical problems. If it is an extreme emergency, then call 999 and ask for an ambulance. It is free to access A and E services and call an ambulance. Remember to call 111 for urgent medical advice in a non-life-threatening situation. Slide 13. How do I make a GP appointment? To see a GP, you must make an appointment. Many require you to make an appointment by telephone or online. Some will also make an appointment if you visit their surgery. Ask your GP practice what the process is. You may have to wait a few days for a non-urgent appointment. This is normal for everyone. If you think it is urgent, tell the receptionist when you make an appointment and you may be seen on the same day if it is appropriate. But important to remember you cannot expect to be seen without making an appointment first. It is important to arrive on time for appointments and cancel if you cannot attend. If you do not arrive on time, you may lose your appointment. You can ask to see a male or female GP and your GP surgery will do their best to accommodate this. You must make a separate appointment for each family member as the GP will only be able to see one patient in each appointment. Appointments are usually only 10 minutes long. The majority of GP practices have electronic screens in reception where you check in for your appointment. Sit in the waiting area after checking in. Slide 14. Interpreters. If you need an interpreter, then tell the receptionist when you make the appointment. You are entitled to an interpreter and it is important for you and the doctor to understand each other. If you cannot understand your interpreter, you have the right to let them know and get another. You can also request a male or female interpreter. You will not be charged for an interpreter and this may be face to face or over the phone. Everything discussed in the appointment is confidential, including anything discussed in the presence of an interpreter. Slide 15. How do I access medication? 
After your appointment, your GP may want you to take medication and they will write you a prescription. This is a document which says what medication is needed and how to take it. Take the prescription to the pharmacy, which is where medicines are prepared and sold. Remember that if you have an HC2 form, prescriptions are free. Many pharmacies are open until late and on weekends, and you can get some medicines from the pharmacy without a prescription. However, you will have to pay for them. Some pharmacies offer a Pharmacy First scheme. This is available for children and adults who need medication for a number of common ailments. All you need to do is give your pharmacist your NHS number or your child's NHS number to receive advice and where appropriate, medicines free of charge. Ask your GP about their process for getting repeat prescriptions if they are necessary. Repeat prescriptions can be ordered online, but you need to collect the medication from a pharmacy of your choice. Slide 16. Prescriptions. Here is an example of a prescription form. As you will be eligible for free prescriptions after receiving your HC2 form, remember to mark a line in the box in row L, which says HC2 Full Help Certificate. Slide 17. When you get a prescription, it is important to understand how to take it. Number one describes the medication, such as its name, strength and quantity in the prescription. Number two provides instructions on taking the medication, such as when and how many. Number three provides warnings on side effects and interactions. Slide 18. In the UK, self-care is important for minor issues such as colds. We treat these with products such as paracetamol and Calpol for children. You can find these in the supermarket, which may be the cheapest place. Antibiotics are not routinely given due to concerns about antibiotic resistance. This means that if you take them when you do not need them, they may not work for you in future when you do need them. Many conditions will get better on their own without using antibiotics. So follow advice from your pharmacist or doctor regarding whether you need them or not. Slide 19, Children's Health. It is important to keep your child vaccinated. You'll usually be contacted by your GP surgery when your child is due for a routine vaccination. This could be a letter, text, phone call or email. If you know your child is due for a vaccination, it's best to speak to your GP surgery to book the appointment. You do not need to wait to hear from them. It could be at your GP practice or a local child health clinic. You can get support and advice from a health visitor if your child is between naught or zero and five years old. Health visitors support all pregnant women and young children up to the age of five with a range of health checks at key points in their early life. This includes an antenatal check and continues up until two and a half years old. This is to make sure that children are growing well and meeting the expected milestones supported by their parents. Where necessary, help and advice is provided, including forming a bond with your child, breastfeeding and healthy eating, keeping a happy head, and any immunisation requirements. 
These visits are usually in the home, but the health visitor may invite you to join groups, clinics and networks run by the health visiting team or colleagues who work with them, such as nursery nurses, children's centre staff, voluntary organisations or community mothers. When you first learn that you are pregnant, book an appointment with your GP to let them know so that you can receive all of the necessary support. Slide 20. Dental care. A dentist is an expert in oral health. Regular checkups allow your dentist to see if you have any dental problems and help keep your mouth healthy. In addition to registering with a GP, you will need to register with a dental practice. Dental practices provide both private and NHS care. Register at a dental practice as an NHS patient. They may not have capacity to take on new NHS patients, so you may have to join a waiting list or look for a different dentist who is taking on new NHS patients. Cosmetic dental treatment is not free. Slide 21 eye care. Your eyes rarely hurt when something is wrong with them, so having regular eye tests is important to help detect potentially harmful conditions. The NHS recommends that you should have your eyes tested every two years. Go to an optician, they will test your eyes for any abnormalities or conditions and can prescribe and fit glasses and contact lenses. Opticians will register you as an NHS patient, so eye tests and essential treatment is free of charge. Slide 22, screening programmes. There are screening programmes in the UK to detect different conditions such as cervical, breast, and bowel cancers. You will be automatically offered screening by receiving a letter when you are the appropriate age for a certain test. You do not have to undergo screening if you do not wish. However, detection of a problem earlier means that treatment is more effective and can reduce the risk of death from certain conditions. Slide 23. Contraception. Contraception is also known as birth control and family planning. Contraception is free on the NHS. You can get contraception and advice from the GP surgery, pharmacy or sexual health clinic. Slide 24. Sexual health clinics. These are also known as gum clinics, G-U-M. As well as contraception, they provide other services, such as testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections, advice and information about sexual health, HIV testing, including rapid tests that give results in about 30 minutes, and counselling for people who are HIV positive and PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis, which is medicine that can help prevent people from developing HIV if they have been exposed to it. Not every clinic will provide all of these services, and you may have to book an appointment rather than drop in, so check your local clinic. Slide 25. Keeping a happy head. It is important to understand how the traumatic experiences you've been through in your home country and on the journey to the UK can affect you. Most asylum seekers and refugees have experienced trauma, fear and loss. Feeling stressed, 
anxious and worried is normal when you are waiting for a decision on your asylum case, which may take a very long time. You may also struggle to sleep, lack energy and be sad or tearful. This is normal in these circumstances. It is important to talk about how you feel and get help if you need it. This can be to a friend, not just a professional. Slide 26. If you have suffered with symptoms for a few weeks and they are affecting your daily life, then make an appointment to speak with your doctor. How we feel in our head, whether this is happy or sad, is called mental health in the UK. This does not mean someone is mad or crazy. Anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is also known as PTSD, and depression are common. Advice is also available on the NHS website to support you to feel better. It also gives you details of support organisations and their helplines that you can contact for help and advice. Slide 27. It is important not to remain isolated and inactive whilst waiting for your decision. Otherwise, these feelings may get worse. Other people who have lived through this experience strongly recommend you take action to break this circle and protect your emotional well-being. Although asylum seekers are not allowed to work in the UK and could be waiting for many months for a decision, there are still ways you can pass the time meaningfully and positively. This will keep you feeling stronger. They recommend you take action by being proactive and regaining some control over your life, such as by connecting to other people. Don't sit in your room alone. Find out where there is a local drop-in for asylum seekers, or a community centre, or a group of people from your community. You will meet lots of other people this way, both people going through the same experience as you, and English people who want to help. Information will be in the handout. You can ask your Mears Welfare Officer for information too. It's important to talk about how you feel, rather than keep how you feel to yourself and suffer in silence. Talking to others breaks this isolation. It can be therapeutic. You can also get professional help, if you need it, by talking to your GP and asking to be referred to talking therapies. You can also get involved in activities. Many of these local groups run a range of activities such as conversational English, vegetable gardening, cooking, singing, visits to local sites and sport like football. These can keep you active and you can learn new things. After six months, you will be eligible to study some courses for free at a local further education college. And you can volunteer with local groups. Volunteering is unpaid, but it is a very good way of practicing and improving your English, of learning how things work in the UK, widening your connections and knowledge, learning new things and giving back. Being a volunteer can also provide you with references and experience which will be useful for future employment. And you can be active. Adults should aim for at least 150 minutes of physical activity per week and children should aim for at least one hour per day. This can be spread out over the week and doesn't have to cost money. You can go for a walk in your local area, such as a park, alone or with family and friends. Slide 28. Healthy living. 
Our lifestyle has a big impact on our health. Smoking is extremely damaging to health and increases your risk of cancers, heart attacks and strokes. It is the biggest cause of preventable death worldwide. Secondhand smoking is also damaging to health and increases your risk of getting the same health conditions as smokers. Children are extremely vulnerable to the effects of secondhand smoking, such as having a higher risk of developing chest infections and meningitis. Smoking or passive smoking in pregnancy increases risk of miscarriage, premature birth and stillbirth. You can ask for advice at the pharmacy or GP practice and access a specialist service to help you quit. Slide 29. Drinking too much alcohol can damage our health, increasing risks of certain cancers, liver disease and stroke. There is no safe amount of alcohol to drink but it is advised to drink no more than 14 units per week. Spread your drinking over three days or more and have several drink free days every week. Slide 30. Alcohol can be addictive and it is a poor coping mechanism, so don't rely on it to get through difficult times. Talk to someone about how you are feeling if you do not have a happy head and get help if you need it. Slide 31. Our diet is important when staying healthy. You should think about how your energy balance may change. Whilst you are waiting for a decision, you may be less active than when you were back home. If you eat the same as before, but are less active, you will put weight on. If you put weight on, you may become overweight and be more at risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes and some cancers. Slide 32. Eating too much sugar is bad for health, as it can be very easy to gain weight and it's bad for teeth. Cheap, convenient foods such as certain cereals or chocolate bars contain lots of sugar and are low in nutritional quality. You should avoid adding too much sugar to drinks such as tea and coffee. Fizzy drinks are often high in sugar and also contain caffeine, which can affect children's attention and behavior. Eating too much salt is also bad for health, as it can raise blood pressure and increase risk of heart attacks and strokes. Lots of salt may be hidden in some foods, particularly cheap convenience foods such as pizzas, tinned food and ready meals. You should avoid adding salt to your meals. Eating too much fat can be bad for your health as it can raise your cholesterol, which increases risk of heart attacks and strokes. Avoid using too much oil or butter when preparing and cooking food. Convenience foods can also be high in fat, such as chocolate, biscuits and cake. Fast food may contain too much sugar, salt and fat. It is of low nutritional quality, so shouldn't be eaten regularly. Slide 33. Physical activity can reduce risk of major illnesses such as cancer, type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Adults should aim for at least 150 minutes of physical activity per week and children should aim for at least one hour per day. Any activity where your heart rate raises, you breathe faster and feel warmer counts. You don't have to take part in a sport or join a club.
Thank you for listening to this information session. There is a leaflet you can download which summarises this information and it has links to further useful information on the NHS and other websites. This information session and the leaflet is available in other languages. Please check the website. Thank you.